Okay, so we are back for session two of abortion policy and Christian social ethics in the post Roe United States. My name is Mako Nagasawa. I'm the director of the Anastasis Center for Christian Education and Ministry. Um, we do a lot of work around healing atonement and restorative justice. Uh, and abortion is uh, sits at w one of the big intersections of different um, uh, questions about how justice and uh, what what does it mean that God's justice is restorative? So uh, I wrote a book called Abortion Policy and Christian Social Ethics in the United States that was published last year. And there's some, there's some things that I'm pulling from that book and, and connecting it to new material that's, or, and new issues that are coming up now that the Dobbs decision uh, <clears throat> has been handed down by the Supreme Court and Roe has been overturned. So the objectives of this course are to trace out what Jewish and Christians leader, Christian leaders have said about the fetus and abortion over time and why. Number two, identify mistakes Christians have made and aim to correct them. And this is re in regards to contraception, economics, um, and, and policies, not just personal choices or, or church policies, but, um, but policy preferences. And then to discern how abortion is used for other political purposes. And, and you'll see a lot of what that means um, in this session, in the latter half of this session. So just a little bit of background again on how to connect if you are interested in engaging with this material later, or if you're watching a recording of this and, and want to know how to discuss this, there's our website, the anastasiscenter.org. Uh, there's also our YouTube channel where eventually these things will be posted. Uh, right now I'm posting YouTube links, I, I'm sorry, the, um, the, the Zoom video links, and so you can uh, connect that way. There's our Facebook discussion group, which is called Healing Atonement and Restorative Justice, and then all the standard social media stuff. So please feel free to engage, ask questions on, on those platforms. <clears throat> what we're going to do today is a brief recap of session one. We're going we're gonna to look at Broadly speaking, abortion, poverty, and uh, private property. And we're going to look at early versus later Christian views on wealth and poverty because poverty does impact uh, the abortion rate. And, and there are even two basically conflicting views about how, how to interpret that. Uh, we'll have a chance to discuss that. And then we'll talk about other people's children and the modern pro-life movement and then discuss that. And then we'll have some open q and I do plan to finish uh, you know, the, the discussion portion uh, before or at 10 o'clock. And then I'm happy to stick around for another hour or so. So feel free to do that. Uh, if you need to go though, you'd be blessed to do that. Uh, but just to give you a sense of time. So here's a recap from session one. Session one was about scripture and science. And essentially, um, I think the history, is, we, we talked about how the early Christians actually didn't know which manuscript to use, whether the Hebrew Masoretic or the Greek Septuagint version of Exodus 21. And they actually, some, um, or they, they looked to Hippocrates and Aristotle. In other words, the, the two leading uh, scientific authorities of their day. In some cases, they developed a stricter abortion policy than what scripture would call for, which is remarkable. And yet that becomes handed down as Christian tradition without recognizing what it is that we've done. We've imbibed or we've baptized Aristotle and Hippocrates into our views of the fetus and abortion. That's amazing uh, to, to understand and recognize. So if you want, again, if you want to see that, uh, please look uh, at the Anastasia Center website and I will, uh, you know, because the link to the Zoom video is there. It also has uh, a lot of significance for U.S. history because the Catholics, at, well, at the time of the U.S. Constitution, abortion was early abortion before quickening uh, or ensoulment was legal and accepted. <clears throat> it also has views about how Christians engage with science. It also has implications for how Christians engage with science. All right, so today we're going to talk about early versus later Christian views on wealth and poverty, and here's why. So probably many of you know this, uh, that the cost of having children is quite high. If you don't have health insurance as of 2020, 
giving birth to a child in the hospital cost on average $15,000 nationwide. And there's a, a good article that talks about this over uh, in each state. Uh, in California, it's something like $26,300. Arizona, $19,000. Incredible. Then you look at baby formula. In 2016, it was $2,300. As of May of 22, it was $2,900 per year. Childcare costs anywhere from $4,000 to $10,000 a year, depending on where you are. And then you, uh, you know, just think, then you just go down the list. Diapers, um, <clears throat> food, and then saving for college, all of these things. And, and that's not even talking about uh, physical and mental health issues and so on. By contrast, abortion pills cost less than $400 and abortion surgery costs anywhere between $400 and $2,000. Now, that raises a big question about uh, how do we think about poverty and economics in relation to abortion? What, what is going on here? And this is uh, you know, where we get into different views of how, what is the best way? It, do we just strengthen the family or do we strengthen the, the, the whole uh, population economically? What is the best way to do that? And how does Christian thought guide us? Now, <clears throat> we, we have to look at some of the kind of the real impacts here. In a New York Times article last year, the, uh, the Times pointed out that the typical abortion patient is already a mother in her late 20s, attended some college, has a low income, is unmarried, is in her first six weeks of pregnancy, is having her first abortion and lives in a blue state. The reason I'm pointing this out is because there, there is often a misconception, I think, that's common among Christians that women who procure abortions or go looking for abortions are, are simply using it as a form of birth control um, and otherwise feel like it's, it's about their upward mobility. Well, some of these things, surely that does exist. But when you look broadly speaking and when, when you ask, okay, why is it that the typical abortion patient actually has a low income and is her late 20s and is already a mother, that starts to change our picture. Um, other stats, married women get the majority of abortions in Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America. In the US, married women get somewhere between 14 and 15% of abortions. So if you say, if you estimate uh, anywhere for, about, uh, let's say, a million abortions per year, that's still a pretty substantial amount, which impacts this, this, uh, this notion, um, I think, among conservatives, that if you just have kid, if you just have sex while you're married, then you'll be fine, right? Like having premarital sex, that's a problem, but having sex when you're married, that's fine. Well, this is starting to, this is starting to impact what we think about that. Would we really be fine? And women who are already mothers are procuring 60% of abortions. Half of those have two or more children already. And so we could talk about why it is that um, marriage rates are lower or, or more people are divorced or so on and so forth. But it, essentially, it starts to trouble the assumption that if you're just married, then you'll be okay <clears throat> economically and for child raising, especially when we look at women in poverty. Women in poverty have three times the abortion rate of women not in poverty. Another way to look at that is between 2000 and 2008, they have procured 42.4% of all abortions, even though people in poverty are about 15% of the total US population. So <clears throat> um, I, I know I'm kind of briefly reviewing the, uh, the blog post that I asked you to read. This is where we get, we need to get into why is it that Christians think more often than other people that being in poverty is a, a lack of effort on, on the part of the poor. So here are some stats. If you're atheist, agnostic, or have no religious affiliation, broadly speaking, this is a survey done of over 1,800 people, 31% said lack of effort causes poverty versus 65% uh, on 
difficult circumstances, things outside of their control, whether it's uh, health problems the, or the structure of the economy, systemic issues, Black Christians, very similar to that, 32% versus 64%. All Christians, you, you start to see this rise. Uh, once you lump all Christians together, 46% said lack of effort. Catholics said 50% said lack of effort. And white evangelicals top the list. 53% of white evangelicals said lack of effort. So that's substantially more. That's about 3.2 to 1. Uh, your white evangelicals are 3.2 to 1 times more likely to say that people are poor because it's their own fault. Why is that? Um, we'll get into that later. But I do want to point out that the early church thought very seriously about poverty and the role of poverty in their thinking. So here is Basil of Caesarea. And if you re recall, Basil of Caesarea had, uh, he was a doctor as well as a bishop. He was one of the leading uh, voices in the generation of the, uh, the Nicene Creed and the, uh, the, the time of the second uh, ecumenical council in 381. And, <clears throat> uh, and he, he died just before that, but he was uh, one of the acknowledged leaders of the church there. He had one of the more strict abortion policies, like he, he uh, followed Hippocrates and said, we're not going to perform abortions. At the same time, in one of his letters, he says this, uh, if a woman abandons her newborn child uncared for on the road, if although she was really able to save it, meaning she had the means, right? She has the financial wherewithal. She disregarded it, either thinking in this way to conceal her sin or scheming in some entirely brutal and inhuman manner. Let her be judged as for murder. But if she was unable to protect it and the child perished through destitution and the want of necessities of, of life, the mother is to be pardoned. So there he's talking about infanticide. This was very common in the ancient world, uh, especially in the ancient pagan Roman Empire, but the Christians are starting to, uh, well, uh, right away, they push back against it. Now, the, the, the issue here, it, of course, is, uh, um, I, I assume, this is about, the context of this is, this is about church discipline. This is not about the formation of the law in Roman in the Roman Empire. So Basil is talking about how long do we withhold communion or the Eucharist from people, right? And he's he's giving some parameters for that. And and uh, this is the subject of a lot of discussion in the fourth century because bishops are able to, they're not being persecuted as much. They can compare notes. They can standardize some of their practices. This is kind of standard organizational behavior. And, and so this is the context of that discussion. Like, um, this is what people need to do for penance or peni being penitential, uh, which is an aspect of restorative justice. And eventually, like after a few years, up to 10 years, he's saying, no, let's restore people to full fellowship, even if they've done these kinds of things. And, and, and so he's talking about infanticide. I assume that he would feel the same way about abortion because those two things were lumped together. And what's important here is that he says, uh, yes, infanticide is wrong and abortion is wrong in our view in the church, but poverty makes it, an, it gives an allowance for it. We're sympathetic to that. So they're, they're taking a broad pastoral view. They're saying it's not just about individual actions. It's about a social context. And we need to take that into account as Christian leaders. That's really significant really significant. Do Christians today think that? Do we, do we, what do we think about poverty? And so uh, I'm going to point out how colonialism really changed uh, how Christians treat wealth and think about issues of wealth and poverty. So prior to colonialism, Christians generally believed this. God gave land to humanity in common as a gift. God gave land to peoples with some sense of boundaries, and there's some scripture to demonstrate that this is how they talked about it. Uh, but in general, they said the earth is the Lord's and the fruit of the earth belong to all. Deuteronomy 24, which I've listed there, is just one example. It's probably the best example, but it, it's called the law of gleaning in Jewish law. And basically, if you owned a field and you had crops, you could go through it once, but the, you know, your second harvest of the year, because crops 
uh, bear fruit multiple times a year. You, you had to leave for the poor, the orphan, the widow, and it was for them. So even though you owned the land technically, uh, you were not free to dispose of it as you wanted. God still made a claim on it, and he said that belongs to the poor. Fascinating. So I, I had you read some quotes, and I'll just read them again and comment a little bit on them. I want you to, sh I want you to notice how often the fourth century bishops are referring back to creation. When giving, this is Ambrose of Milan, when giving to the poor, you are not giving him what is yours, rather you are paying back what is his. In other words, it's about justice, not mercy. Indeed, what is common to all and has been given to all to make use of, you have usurped for yourselves alone. The earth belongs to all and not only to the rich. You are paying back, therefore, your debt. You are not giving gratuitously what you do not owe. Fascinating. This is about justice. It is not mercy. Uh, Basil of Caesarea, that bread which you keep belongs to the hungry, that coat which you preserve in your wardrobe to the naked, those shoes which are rotting in your possession to the shoeless, that gold which you have hidden in the ground to the needy. Wherefore, as often as you are able to help others and refuse, so often you did them wrong. So it belongs to them, give it to them. You are stealing if you, if you keep it. You, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, is talking about slavery and he connects it to Genesis 1. You condemn a person to slavery whose nature is free and independent, and in so doing, you lay down a law in opposition to God, overturning the natural law established by him. What natural law? The law in Genesis 1. And he makes that clear. For you subject to the yoke of slavery, one who was created precisely to be a master of the earth. So rule and have dominion. Every single person is supposed to have some form of dominion, some enjoyment of the creation, some interaction with the land where they possess it, who was ordained to rule by the creator as if you were deliberately attacking and fighting against the divine command. How much money did you pay as a fair price for the image of God? For how much have you sold the nature especially formed by God? God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. And he goes on. He is very clear. Genesis 1 is still live. It's a live vision for how people, how Christians are to think about how God gifts the whole creation to all people. And if we interfere with that, like as with slavery or with poverty, then we're sinning. That is huge. Uh, John Chrysostom of Constantinople, Archbishop of Constantinople, says, are not the earth and the fullness thereof the Lord's? If therefore our possessions are the common gift of the Lord, they belong also to our fellows, for all the things of the Lord are common. Thomas Aquinas, the uh, most venerated Catholic medieval theologian, says this, in cases of need, all things are common property. There is no sin in taking private property when need has made it common. Now, the, there's also an influence on English law, which I want to point out. <clears throat> the high point of Christian influence on English law, you could say it happened in, in three moments, uh, reflecting uh, views about property. The London Church Council in 1102 emancipates all remaining slaves, which, uh, according to stats at the time, was about 10% of the population. So they, abol they formally abolished uh, slavery. They, yes, they moved to serfdom in some way, but that, that is very different than being a slave. Also in 1215, you have the English Magna Carta, which is about political liberty. And in 1217, just two years later, you have the English Charter of the Forest. The forest was the name given at the time for lands held by the crown, uh, and it was uncultivated. So it was, it could be marshland, it could be fields, it could be anything. But essentially the charter of the forest was protection against the aristocrats who wanted to drive out the peasantry from using those lands and enclose it themselves. Uh, so the, the charter of the forest was an economic bill of rights. It guaranteed the peasantry the use of that land to farm, to fish, to chop down a tree and get fuel for wood. So it's, it's like your food bill, your energy bill, your water bill, it's all kinds of things. This was eroded though by the enclosure movement as aristocrats manipulated parliament, drove the peasantry into urban poverty uh, during the industrial revolution, especially they were looking for cheap labor for co cotton factories and criminalized vagrancy. That gives us 
a context in which to understand this man, John Locke. John Locke was the, uh, it has a huge influence on American law and also church culture and our views about private property. He lived from 1632 to 1704. He was the architect of the colonial constitution of Carolina. He thought that the constitution should not change. It should not be amendable. Oh my goodness. He was a major influence on Thomas Jefferson, the US constitution, American legal thought. The primary contribution was about private property, which he regarded as an individual right that, it, that existed, that, gave, that God gave to people prior to entering into community and prior to a government being formed. So government exists to protect property rights and government it should be minimal and enforce only contracts. So this is the libertarian dream. This is Ben Shapiro going on PragerU saying, if we lose John Locke, we lose America. Now there, there are certain things about John Locke that I, that I greatly do respect. There were some things, all men are created equal. Uh, it, there are certain basic rights that exist independent of government and prior to government. And so government exists to protect those rights. But what exactly those rights are, we really need to talk about. Uh, here's a more scholarly. Yes. OK. Uh, here's a more scholarly approach to this. And um, to putting John Locke in context, uh, he was one of a, many theorists about why colonial colonization was OK. So uh, Hugo Grotius said the oceans and uh, are commons, although he later reversed that when it served his purposes. And then you had different theorists about land. Pope Nicholas V <clears throat> uh, used the doctrine of discovery and basically said, Portugal and Spain as Catholic countries should not fight over land. It, finders keepers. The Spanish used that and then also physical military might, conquest. John Winthrop among the English Puritans said, we read ourselves into Deuteronomy and it's about God and covenant. God is giving us this land. Roger Williams refuted that and said, nope, uh, God doesn't do that. We have, If we want this land, then we have to purchase it fairly and justly from the Native Americans. And John Locke said labor and enclosure is what contributes uh, or, or how you could get private property. We think of Locke as a political philosopher. He did not think of himself that way. He thought of himself as a biblical scholar and Christian ethicist here are some things that he wrote during that time. And as I had you read during the uh, blog post, he said this, God gave the world to men in common, but it cannot be supposed he meant it should always remain common and uncultivated. He gave it to the use of the industrious and rational and labor was to be his title to it. So in essence, if you work harder than the last guy, you could take his land. Whatsoever then he removes it, um, just going to skip over here. This is his view of Native Americans. There cannot be a clear demonstration of anything than several nations of the Americans are of this, who are rich in land and poor in all the comforts of life, yet for want of improving it by labor have not one one hundredth part of the conveniences we enjoy. And a king of a large and fruitful territory there feeds, lodges, and is clad worse than a day laborer in England. So <clears throat> first of all, that wasn't true. Second, even if it was, what does it prove? So he essentially is asserting Genesis 1 means you could take other people's land if you're more productive. He intentionally misrepresented Native Americans becoming one of the earliest white people to accuse non-white people of laziness. If you want to read Barbara Arneal's book on that, it is stunning. So Locke contributes to why Americans tend to fear smarter immigrants or people of color. This is why the Charlottesville marchers said Jews will not replace us. Why are you so concerned about being replaced? In what sense? Not just like numerically balanced or but replaced well it's because we did it before which is why we have a culture of workaholism why we believe productivity justifies the destruction of land and believe that america is a pure meritocracy even when it isn't uh Locke was tempered in the early u.s he the, the phrase life liberty and the pursuit of happiness in the declaration thomas jefferson wanted it to read straight from Locke: life liberty and property benjamin franklin argued back and said no we can't say that because private property is the creation of society society comes first and then we allocate private property or decide how to deal with it and that's enshrined in the u.s constitution because of eminent domain in the fifth amendment however it Locke's influence on people like wayne grudem and other white evangelicals is profound this is what he says. Wayne Grudem, by the way, is 
probably the best-selling author of a systematic theology textbook, and he also wrote a very thick book called Politics According to the Bible, and said the Bible clearly takes the side of individual ownership of property. My conclusion is that the estate tax should be permanently re repealed. If you compare that to Genesis 1 and how the early Christians thought of that, also Israel's land vision and Jesus's table vision, where God resets the land and family land boundaries every 50 years, and Paul even says in 2 Corinthians 8.14 that there may be equality within the church. It's really hard to see. Why does Wayne Grudem conclude that? So here's a chance to discuss. And Bayota, if you, or Ian, if you could drop these questions into the chat. Number one, why do you think white evangelicals are more likely to blame the poor for their own lack of effort than other religious groups? Number two, evaluate the following. The U.S. was established not simply to protect people's religious liberty, but to protect people's ability to practice heretical ideas about slavery, race, and property. So we're not just talking actually about Locke, but also John Calvin on usury and Marcus. Uh, the curse of Ham, which was used against Black people, uh, and what Locke believed about property and government. And so Locke's theory of private property, number three, is a theology of private property. In your own words, how does Locke's departure from earlier Christian ethics contribute to poverty and the abortion rate? Okay, I'm going to give you about a little less than 10 minutes to discuss that. Ready, go. So, uh, so we'll have more time to talk about these things in, in the Q&A. I, I want to develop this a little further and go uh, again. Uh, I, I know this is uh, a lot of this material appeared in the blog post, but I'm going to give a little bit more new information here and talk about why other people's children and the modern pro life movement uh, uh, are really important to think about from a Christian ethics standpoint. Uh, here is Senator Ron Johnson, who I quoted in the blog post. But the, uh, he's just the most recent example of this. Not, I wish I didn't have to just pick on him, but it was easy to pick on him. In January of 2022, he said, I've never really felt it was society's responsibility to take care of other people's children. That, that's a little perplexing, uh, but because we already do things like public education, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, mitigate the, the, the effects of the pandemic on children. But the Specifically, he was talking about uh, being opposed to the child tax credit, which gave a tax credit of $3,600 per child. That's a major uh, contribution. That, that, that's, a, that's a big help to families. But as you know, it expired uh, because it couldn't get the congressional support. He have also op opposed Biden's effort to help families find child care options. And um, in that light, it's important to notice that uh, Many other countries, especially European countries, uh, have publicly funded childcare. Like that, that's a big help to parents. And um, you might also connect that to uh, the abortion rate being lower in, in Western Europe than it is in the US. So I, I think that sure that's a correlational at this point, but there's probably some causal relationship. And Ron Johnson wanted to slash unemployment benefits to make people get back to work. Wow. So uh, that's what he thought. Now, <clears throat> I want to briefly evaluate that. I summarized some of this in the blog post, but briefly. In Christian ethics and just philosophically, it's really difficult to argue uh, for or to, to support Johnson's view. If you're a Christian, then you have to recognize that God always limited intergenerational advantage and disadvantage. So the Jubilee year in Leviticus 25 is when God said, you're all my kids. It's not just that you have kids and other people have their own kids, but you are all my kids. And I gift you the garden land again, as if I'm bringing you there for the first time. Also, there's this, there's this, uh, sense that God does not want children to suffer for their parents' mistakes and misfortunes. Now that we see that in the Jubilee year in Leviticus 25, but that becomes even more explicit in Ezekiel 16 in relation to what, what we call the new covenant, uh, because this dynamic of being exiled, parents being exiled from the land and uh, their children having to suffer for it, you know, that that is the meaning of uh, you know, your children to the second or third generation will suffer for your sins. But if that's not going to happen anymore, then, then 
uh, children will not suffer for their parents' mistakes. And in that light, <clears throat> I mean, that, that's just, it's striking that we do, we totally in the United States make children suffer for the uh, misfortunes and the mistakes of their parents. So whether that's, whether parents did something or whether things were done to them. And, and furthermore, in Christian ethics, there's very clear uh, sense from Jesus that God claims every single person as his child, and he draws them to himself in Christ. And so the way we treat other people's children is, is important uh, because they're God's children. Philosophically, what have children done to deserve all the advantages and disadvantages they can possibly inherit? So I know we like to use the meritocratic fairness principle, but uh, we tend to apply it only to parents. What if we applied it to children? Have children merited anything? Have they done anything to deserve all the possible advantages and disadvantages they can inherit? Well, no. So, so <clears throat> U.S. Catholics, I, I want to talk about an earlier pro-life movement and then contrast it with the modern pro-life movement, which took place starting in the 1979-1980s with the Reagan administration. In the 1930s, U.S. Catholics were the, were the real pro-life movement, and they watched the abortion rate rise during the Great Depression, uh, and, and it made sense to them that poverty drives the abortion rate, because why would you bring kids into the world if you yourself did not have hope? So uh, what they believed is uh, they, they were largely New Deal Democrats. And so they believed in a strong federal government to manage the economy, to bring broad prosperity to Americans um, in, in terms of infrastructure, building things, uh, energy, roads, uh, developing a welfare state or a social support system with unemployment, disability, and social security. They wanted to give housing to at least to white Americans uh, via home loans. Now, let me let me just say, Rose of FDR was kind of hamstrung by the Southern Democrats at the time. knew he wouldn't be able to pass the New Deal without getting their support. So um, there were there were lots of limitations placed on the FHA and the GI Bill, where African Americans and other minorities could not get those same home loans. So it was a big wealth subsidy. It was an affirmative action program to get white people out to white suburbs. And then there was a lot of pro-labor regulations on corporations and trade. So the government protected consumers against indebtedness by limiting banks, protected the econ economy against uh, banking risks, protected workers against competition from slave labor from abroad. So when we think about China exploiting workers and flooding the market, global market and the US market with cheaply produced goods, uh, there, there were tariffs imposed against those things. Um, starting in the New Deal. And, and then there was a vision of demo, a democracy of small businesses uh, because it's not just that we're consumers, we're also producers and contributors. And it should be easy to uh, set up a small business to say to compete with Amazon. But uh, <clears throat> now it is much harder. So this is what happened. So, so what's striking here again is that when Catholics anchored the pro-life cause, they were led to anti-poverty measures. When white evangelicals anchored the pro-life movement, they believed that poverty was the stick motivation. It should be the looming threat above everyone's head because if you have sex before you're ready, if you have kids before you're ready, then poverty should be what you experience. Here is Richard Vigari, who is one of the co-founders of the Moral Majority along with Paul Weyrich and uh, James uh, Jerry Falwell, uh, when he ran for president and, and eventually got behind, they got behind Reagan. And Vigari is describing his fundraising strategy and his way of reaching out to people and bring them, realign them with a, um, a, a new Republican party. The abortion issue is the door through which many people come into conservative politics, but they don't stop there. Their convictions against abortion are like the first in a series of falling dominoes. Then we lead them to a concern about sexual ethics and standards among young people. This leads to opposition to secular humanism. Then particularly in the schools with a purportedly decent morality, we point out that secular humanism is identified as both the godfather and the royal road to socialism and communism. 
which points the way to minimally regulated free enterprise at home and to aggressive foreign and military policy to counter the communist threat of Russia and its many surrogates. What do we say about this? Well, look, what do you think about abortion? Uh, he thought abortion was because people didn't trust God, so it was basically atheism. Why do people get abortion? It's atheism. Why, in history, in real history, why do people get abortion? It's because scripture allowed for some of that, especially early abortion prior to uh, quickening. And as we saw, because of poverty, it's be not because of secular humanism or because people are simply believing the wrong things. Uh, he is reluctant, Begary is reluctant to acknowledge quickening as Christian, which, as we saw from last time, was legal and accepted at the time of the U.S. Constitution and was rooted in the Greek Septuagint text of Exodus 21 plus Aristotle. So they used Aristotle as a scientific support, and it is much stricter uh, than the Hebrew Masoretic text, which says fetal personhood doesn't start until actually the fetus is born and it's birth and breath that marks personhood. But Vigari does not acknowledge any of this, does he? Also, he identifies neoliberal capitalism with true Christianity. The less regulated capitalism is, the more authentic it is to Christianity, even though Christian faith has historically been more pro-labor with the, the Catholic guilds uh, pro-ecology, pro-investing in the population with regards to economic support, literacy, schooling, and health care. So look at all of the, uh, the kings that empowered people with literacy and developed the university system. The Eastern Byzantine Empire developed a, a robust hospital and health care system because of Christian faith. And uh, you, you cannot say that it's just laissez-faire economics that is associated with Christian faith historically. No, that is not true. Nevertheless, what abortion becomes is part of the, the political psychology for many people. You, you, it competes with the rights of oppressed minorities. So for, since the 60s, the, the Republican Party was struggling to find a, a, a counter rhetoric to uh, the civil rights movement. And so once you talk about oppressed minorities, you could say, well, what about the unborn? Look at all those babies that are killed. It also fits the, the principle of individual meritocratic retributive justice. You get what you deserve. So it, with regards to capitalism, that's true. And uh, that's obvious, but it, with regards to abortion, this is how it is structured. If you have if you get married and have kids, then you have a good life. God's blessing you. You should be fine. You should be fine. If you have kids before marriage, you should experience economic hardship. If you perform an abortion, you should be criminally prosecuted. So abortion policy becomes an extension of capitalism and criminality, which, by the way, Reagan was all about. And he shares the belief of, uh, Begary shares the belief of most white evangelicals that God's justice is retributive and not restorative, which we will talk about next time. So what was Reagan's political coalition? He united the foreign policy hawks, the domestic policy folks, and the white evangelicals, all around anti-communism. So the neoconservatives were against the USSR, and the imperialists wanted resources in Latin America. The Pentagon wanted its budget uh, to, to stay really high, which Reagan was glad to comply with. He cut taxes, but increased military spending, driving the U.S. into deficits that we had not seen prior to that. There was an anti-communist, and I put that in scare quotes, domestic policy. Why? Because you, he appealed to libertarians who wanted to, uh, and states' rights, white segregationists who wanted to drive uh, uh, poor and black and other folks into poverty by taking away social supports. The libertarians ostensibly were more ideological about it. And then there are also a lot of anti-labor pro-corporate types who loved Reagan, especially when he bailed out the savings and loan industry. And then you had the white evangelicals. Since the 1930s, there, there were Christian libertarians who were anti-New Deal that made um, alliances between fossil fuels and the Billy Graham campaign. In the 50s and 60s, white evangelicals called Dr. King and other black civil rights leaders communists. 
right? Because anyone who believes that government should actually uh, protect the poor or uh, do something to invest in people like education, uh, healthcare, and so on, that was communism. And in the 80s, abortion then is drawn into this uh, as the sharp tip of the spear, abortions driven by atheism and communism. So this is how uh, Paul Weyrich talked about it. <clears throat> Paul Weyrich, again, is one of the co-founders of the Moral Majority. Uh, he, this quote is important because it shows that evangelicals, uh, white evangelicals, their, their culture war narrative that they were drawn back into national politics to defend the unborn is actually not true. Weyrich says, what galvanized the Christian community was not abortion, school prayer, or the Equal Rights Amendment. I am living witness to that because I was trying to get those people interested in those issues and I utterly failed. What changed their mind was Jimmy Carter's intervention against the Christian schools, trying to deny them tax status on the basis of so-called de facto segregation. What he's referring to is segregation academies because evangelicals opposed Brown v. Board of Education and the integration of public schools. In the South especially, they formed segregation academies and wanted them to stay tax exempt. The legal architecture or their defense of this was, hey, we believe in states' rights against federalism, especially Brown v. Board of Education. Look at those unelected judges. And so they, you know, they're in Washington trying to run our lives. We believe in localism. And then it was done using uh, churches and Christian money. And so they, they thought of it as freedom of religion, but they were really masking racial segregation. Uh, Heather McGee talks about this, and I want to use it as, as a parable. When we disinvest in public swimming pools, uh, when swimming pool, when this country disinvested in public swimming pools, when uh, community pools became in, integrated, what happened? Well, uh, public pools just became, uh, they, they dried up and they grew grass. And what happened to pools? They were privatized. Those people, the white people who could afford it, built private pools in their own backyards. And that's kind of a parable of what happens um, to many states, especially what's interesting is there, there is significant correlation to the 22 states that restricted abortion post Dobbs. So they are much more likely to believe in the uh, you're on your own economics or yo yo economics. Uh, laissez-faire um, ec economics that doesn't protect labor and other things. They also have higher maternal death rates, higher infant mortality rates. Many of those states refuse the ACA Medicaid expansion, and they rank lower in, on the state level in literacy, COVID safety, and a whole bunch of other public uh, metrics. One time check. Okay, thanks. This is uh, also part of the Southern strategy, which was the move of white segregationists from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, especially after 1964. Lyndon B. Johnson predicted this, and uh, Western politicians like Goldwater, Nixon, and Reagan um, started to lead the Republican Party in this direction. There, there's a strong connection to Southern Baptists. And if you really want to read the, this article by Chris Ladd and this book by Heather Cox Richardson, um, Paul Wy Wyrick all, and uh, Mary Ziegler. Her book just came out, talk about loose campaign financing and restrictions on voting rights as connected and actually spearheaded by the anti-abortion movement of the 80s. Paul Weirick says this, I don't want any, everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage, and he's speaking to conservatives, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. So the fewer people vote, the more powerful we are. Okay, so here's the discussion for us. Oops, where did I put my questions? Number one, do you think you're on your own in parenting should be society's retribution for people having sex? Uh, and you can add before they're married. Uh, number two, do you think minimal economic governance and allowing people to fall into poverty is compatible with seeking to bring down the abortion rate? Why or why not? And number three, if you could reduce the abortion rate to zero by financially assisting women to give birth and then providing a stipend to adoptive families for free housing, childcare, healthcare, and college tuition by raising taxes on the rich, would you? Why or why not? So we're going to break you up into breakout rooms and then we'll see you on the other side.
Okay. Uh, so, so I just want to summarize this, the our, our session, and then I'll open it up for open Q. I'll say some things about next time, and then um, open it up for general Q and A uh, it, uh, after after I stop recording. So the the reason why it's really important to uh, think about your view of what is the relationship between poverty and the abortion rate is because um, number, primarily because it's not just uh, an issue of, well, we all share the same kind of goal, which is to reduce the abortion rate. Uh, we just have different mean uh, kind of ideas about how to get there. Actually, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It is more ideological and it is theological. So the ideology is, do you believe poverty drives up the abortion rate or do you believe poverty uh, needs to be there as a looming threat, as the stick motivation so that if people have sex before they're married uh, or have kids without being ready, then they should experience poverty. Those are two very different views. And here's where it is theological and also philosophical, which is John Locke was a heretic when it came to his views of private property. He knowingly departed from the, the Christian consensus about uh, how Christians are supposed to share the wealth and goodness of the creation. Uh, for, for Christians before John Locke, community came first, humanity came first, and then we make some kind of decision communally, politically, on how to share the resources uh, that we have. And periodically that has to get reevaluated, right? John Locke wanted to make private property so fixed that uh, and, and by the way, he, he did believe that parents had an unlimited right to pass down as much private property as possible to their children. So it just, uh, you could, now to his credit, uh, he, he thought there were other things that would mitigate against wealth disparity, but the unevenness in his philosophy and, and his approach and also his willingness to be racist, the uh, is a big problem. So we really need to think about uh, why it is that the modern anti-abortion movement uh, has used abortion as an expression of capitalism. I think that's self-defeating on its face. In other words, it, it makes the abortion rate go up. So, so if you're a single issue voter or you know people who are single issue voters, this really should complicate uh, that decision because you could vote in a nominally anti-abortion uh, way, but all the other things that this current instantiation of the Republican party, uh, and because there have been others that were not like this, right? Eisenhower's Republican party, obviously Lincoln's Republican party, they didn't think this way, but Reagan's version of the Republican Party, uh, which continues, uh, really elevates the principle of meritocratic retributive justice and fits abortion into that. So uh, that sets us up to talk next time. Session three will be about God's justice is restorative, not retributive. And what is the impact that has, uh, or what impact could that have on abortion and abortion related policies? So I, I will send you more information about that uh, during the week. I look forward to being with you again and talking more. And um, let, me, let me stop the recording now and uh, we can hang out in open Q&A for as long as you would like.